Today we're going to do uh, 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 probably an unusual uh, lesson here. We've been doing a creation seminar. If you've got your books, open up to uh, page 18, okay? And uh, that's where you can take your notes. Um, I'm not going to have you stand and open the Bible here because I'm going to do a lot of stuff. But if you want to find your Bible, open to Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 26 and 27. That's where our focus is going to be out of today, Okay. So we've been doing a creation conference, and we've covered in that creation conference so far up till this Sunday school, we've covered the, some of the seven seas of history. Now, not everybody knows what those are, and those actually come from a, a creation organization that has de designed that to be able to kind of help us understand how the Bible is outlined. You got creation, corruption, which is the fall when man sins. You got uh, catastrophe, which is Noah's flood that happens about... Uh, 1,600 years after creation, and then you have uh, confusion, which happens about 125 years after the Noah's flood, and that's what we talked about this morning in Sunday school. And then you have a big jump, at least from your Bible's perspective, a big jump, and it goes to Christ, His coming cross, which is where He satisfies the debt that God uh, demands to be paid for sin to be uh, uh, dealt with, and then you have consummation, which is the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, and this is where everything's brought back and restored and redeemed and glorified and even made better than what it was before, okay? Now, I've given you some of these seven C's here. I want you to look at there. When, when God created the world there, he created it in a very good world. It was a very good world. Let me kind of give you the outline of how this worked. On day number one, God created the heaven, the earth, and light, okay? He uh, set the, the calendar for how how uh, the work, work, work week would be, how days would be. Uh, he, he called it the evening and the morning, and he does that every day. The evening and the morning were the first day, evening and the morning the second day, and so forth. On day number two, uh, he creates the, or he separates the, the waters, and uh, there's a whole uh, lesson there that we could look at, but he separates, and really what we'd say how that benefits to us is that he created atmosphere. Uh, you get to breathe because of what happened on day number two. How many people have ever flown on an airplane before? Raise your hand. You were able to do that because of day number two. How many people are hearing me right now? You're hearing me because my sound is projecting through, through air molecules that are hitting your ears, and your ears are uh, hearing that, okay? Um, we have all sorts of things that are beneficial in that regard. You get... Uh, uh, plants that get seed dispersal because of the wind and so forth like that. There's lots of different things. You get rain because of the weather and the atmosphere, okay? All that is day number two uh, benefit, okay? Day number three, and that's where God takes this earth that's now only water and he makes dry land and then on the dry land he puts vegetation on that and there he's preparing again. He's preparing, the first day he prepares the day, the second day he prepares the atmosphere, the third day he prepares the dry land and he prepares food. How many people ate today? Amen. How many people ate something that, got, that was grown out of a garden or grown out of a field somewhere? Nobody. What do you do? Eat? All you guys are carnivores. Do you know those carnivores relied on stuff that was grown out of fields? So, so you benefited indirectly, right? I'm sure some of you, how many people ate cereal today? Did you eat beef cereal or pork cereal? Okay. How many people ate donuts today? There you go, you ate something that was grown out of a field. It wasn't grown that way, but it was grown, okay? All right, day number four. Uh, we come to um, the, 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 what God is gonna do outside of the planet, and he creates the sun, moon, and stars, and it tells us that he creates them for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. And this is all, again, directly aimed at the earth. Everything that he's doing is really preparing the planet. He's preparing the, the world for life, and specifically for one particular group of life, and those are human beings, which we're going to look at here in just a minute. Day five, we see the very first introduction to life, where God creates the, the fish, God creates the wells. He creates the giant, big giant creatures there. If you look on your, on your display, you even have some creatures that are unusual that we'd have in a picture like that, the dinosaurs. If you come this afternoon uh, to the question and answer session, we're going to talk about, the Bible, talk about how the Bible talks about dinosaurs a lot. Not just in a couple places, a lot. And so we'll, we'll look at that here tonight. Uh, but you have, obviously, the creatures of the sea, and then you have uh, creatures of the air are all created on day five. This is the first time you see in the Bible that the Bible describes the word life. 
that life is that which is able to reproduce and move and breathe, okay? So those are things that we see that happens. And then on day number six, we see God creating the, uh, the land creatures. And uh, obviously there you see some majorly different kinds of animals as well. Dinosaurs obviously would be on that one. And the final part of the creation is man. The Bible says in, Rome, or in Psalm chapter number eight that it's, he is the crown of the creation. Man is the crowning touch of the creation. Everything else really was for them. All that God was doing and all of that that was happening, God was doing that for man, okay? Now, <clears throat> as I pointed out in our creation series, if you've been with us and have come over any of the days that we've done this, we've been trying to show how that the world has a different viewpoint than, than God's word does. The world has been trying to convince people that uh, we are really just a product of chance and long time that we are, we are animals that are highly evolved. In fact, they really, if you go back down to it, they say that we are nothing more than just goo that has come and made you, right? Goo to you. Uh, you, are, you are just just something that's a big cosmic accident. You were not ever intended to be. There was nobody intending anything. You're just an accident, okay? That's the evolutionary worldview, and I'm sure many of you have heard that in your science classes before. How many people have heard that? In, if you go to public school, I've heard that before, that uh, we are the product of evolution. Yeah. Well, a few people, okay? Maybe, maybe, some of you, maybe most of you go to homeschool, or, right? You get a Christian education, all right. Well, maybe it's important to know. But you know with this viewpoint, they say that, you know, some, somebody way, way back in your family line looked like that. Your great, 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 great grandfather was a monkey. Okay? That's the evolutionary viewpoint. Okay? And that's, that is absolutely true. I'm not making something up. That's absolutely true. I was at the uh, Natural History Museum in Washington, D.C. this summer, and that's where... That's what they were touting. That's what they were teaching, okay? They were pushing that, that that's where you came from. But the Bible has an entirely different viewpoint of what you are and what you were made. The Bible says that when God made man, he made him absolutely perfect. Um, he, is, he is absolutely complete in all that he is supposed to be. Now, the scripture tells us in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, that God formed the man of the dust of the ground, uh, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then it tells us here that it, God said when he did this, and go back to Genesis chapter number one, verse number 26, he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then if you look there where I highlighted it again, in his own image. And then down right after that, in the image of God. Four different times he says that we are made in the image of God. If you look in those two verses, made in the image of God or made in the likeness of God. Now, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? What does that mean? Well, the word image means to resemble, and the word likeness means to be similar, to be similar. So the, the idea here is that you are like God in the world. God sees you as one that is like him. You, are, you resemble him in the world, and you are similar to him in the world. That's what you are supposed to be. Okay, that's what everybody in this room is supposed to be. You resemble God in the world and you are like God in the world. You say, well, I don't feel like I'm much like God, but you're supposed to be. Right. You resemble him. In fact, being saved is, is really a chance of being, being restored back to that image that was broken and marred when sin entered into the world. That God is restoring us into the image of Jesus Christ, which is really the image of the invisible one. He's restoring us back to that. So we are to represent him in the world. So let me give you some elements of what that looks like. What does it look like to be an image bearer? Well, one, uh, being a, an image bearer means that you are gonna be creative like he is. If you're like him, you will be like that, right? Human beings have the ability to be creative and have come up with designs. Let me give you some things. That, let me show you some pictures of things that we are creative. Uh, there's a George W. Bush painting. How many people know who that guy is? Maybe it's, well, he's too old for you. Okay. Uh, George W. Bush used to be a president, but he's painting. Uh, how many people like to paint or draw? Raise your hand in here. Okay. You know what you're doing? You're demonstrating that you're different than the animal world. Animals don't do that. They don't paint and draw. Even crude drawings, <laughs> they don't. Um, you know what else we do? We have the ability to write. How many people like to write? There's some people in here, I imagine, that like to write. 
Not a, that's not a talent that everybody loves, but you know that's, that's part of being made in the image of God. Um, how many people play music? How many people like to get involved in doing music? Okay, that's, that's a characteristic of being made in the image of God. Uh, here's another one. People are able to make machinery and complex machinery. When is the last time you've seen a monkey doing that? <laughs> Say, well, they can use tools. Yeah, I could use a stick and beat something. Boom, 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 boom. That's a tool. God didn't give that creativity to, hum to animals. He gave that to man to be able to design that. Here's, here's something that's amazing. Look at this. This is a tower that uh, somebody built. Look at this. Isn't that an amazing tower? Beautiful structure. Somebody came up with that and built that. And you go, how in the world did they do that? Here's, here's something else. Maybe none of you have done that. I'm guessing yet. Maybe someday there's somebody that's a future, a future uh, tower builder, right? Future... Uh, what do they call those people? The architect. Yeah, future architect. I should know all these things, shouldn't I? I'm, I'm supposed to be the expert here. Okay. <laughs> How many people like to go and smell flowers and enjoy beauty? Some girls in here probably. Guys, you can raise your hand if you feel, uh, feel manly enough to say it. Okay. I'm not trying to get you to go down that path. Okay. But you know what? We have the ability to, to appreciate beauty. That's something that animals don't do. It's part of the creative nature we have. It's part of the creative nature that God has made us. Second, we are moral. Let me give you this one. Moral like God is moral. We're moral like God is moral. The Bible says that God is holy, that he hates sin. Mankind understands what it means to have a moral nature and appreciates right things. In fact, I think it's amazing that people get upset, people who do wrong, <laughs> get upset with people who do wrong to them. Or they see somebody else being treated wrong and they get upset about it even though it may not even involve them. Why is that part of us? It's because we're made moral. We understand that right is good and wrong is bad. And especially from a fallen perspective, we recognize when somebody does us wrong, something needs to stop. Somebody needs to be punished, right? And it's the reason why we feel shame it's the reason why we apologize. It's the reason why we make laws to punish crimes. You don't see the animal kingdom doing any kind of thing like this. I mean, one, they can't write. Two, they don't have any kind of courts where they do any kind of figuring out who did wrong or what, you know, the, the, the gorilla did it. Nobody's doing that. Yeah, which gorilla did it? Um, nobody gets put in jail in the animal world. But human beings do it. Why do we do it? Because we have something moral about us. It's, it's what we do as representatives of God in the world. We bear his likeness in the world. Uh, third, um, we are relational. We are relational like God is relational. Uh, how do we demonstrate relational? Well, if you remember when God made man, look what it says in the scripture here, that when God made man, he said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. This is the very first time you see a, a, a hint of the fact that God is more than one, uh, that God has, has more parts to him, if you will, than just being the father. He is the father. What is he? The son and the Holy Spirit. There's three persons and one God. And here, for the very first time, we see that, that being displayed here. At the very beginning, God is saying, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Have you ever thought about it? Say, people say, well, what, what, did God do before, what did God do before he made people? I mean, how did he even have any? I mean, he would have, that would have been extremely boring for eternity past to just exist and be nothing except just you all by yourself. He never was. He never was. He's always been in a relational existence. And when God made man, he made him with that understanding and that comprehension. Um, in fact, on the very first day man was made, here's a good one. Very first day man was made, he, they got married. <laughs> Adam and Eve got married. God, in fact, God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. And he says, I'm going to make him a help meet for him, a help that's designed for him. And he makes a woman for him. And it says, and the two become one. And there's this relational sense. And by the way, there's not one that's made in the image of God. Adam and Eve is just lesser than that. Adam and Eve are both declared to be, in Genesis chapter 1, image bearers. They both bear the image of God. They both bear that image. 
because that's part of their nature to, to be relational. But not only do we understand that with human relationships, you know, marriage or friendships and all those kinds of things that come into human relationships that we have, but we also have an ability to be relational with God. Your dog doesn't have a relationship with God. Your cat doesn't bow down and talk to God and to Jesus. No animal does. Why? Because they're not made in the image of God in that sense. They might come and look at your feet to try to get you to give them something or pet them or whatever, but that's not the same. Not the same at all. Okay? You are relational. Here's, a, here's another thing we see about what it means to be made in the image of God, and that is that we have the ability to communicate. We have the ability to communicate. Part of being relational is that you communicate. Seth, does it go good if you don't talk to your wife very long? I mean, is that going to work out good for your relationship? Probably not. It doesn't work out for any relationship if you don't have communication, does it? Uh, it's part of what it means to be made in the image of God that people, that people uh, communicate with one another. Um, Here's something we talked about this morning in our uh, Sunday school class and that we were talking about confusion at the Tower of Babel in the languages. Man doesn't do what animals do. They don't grunt, growl, hoot. I mean, they might if they're really, you know, acting foolish or act, getting waking up out of the bed and not really got everything working up there in the brain, right? But that's not our normal type of communication, is it? It's not how we talk to people. God has given us the ability to have complex, complicated language. And we can communicate complex, co uh, complicated ideas. We're able to do that. Now, some may be able to do it better than others, but we all have the ability to communicate abstract things, things that you can't even physically hold or touch, but we can communicate. We, we can communicate feelings. Uh, and we can communicate all sorts of different things that, that no animal could ever do. We are not an animal. We are made in the image of God, okay? So we are able to communicate. Um, I remember watching a, or, or reading something. I was reading an article about how they tried to get a, 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 a chimpanzee. They set him in front of a typewriter. Now, that's not a typewriter. That's a, that's a computer. But they set him in front of a typewriter, and they wanted to see. They were going to let him bang on the, 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 the typewriter and see if he could actually uh, come up with one word. And they let him do it for quite a while, banging on this thing, banging on this thing. You think he would come up with at least one. Even there are one letter words like I, A. A. And they're going through all of this stuff and they said he never did it once. Even with all the letters he's making, he never put the proper space in between it to make a, a special letter, one letter word A or I. He didn't do it. You say, why didn't he do that? Because well, he doesn't understand language. Because he doesn't understand typing. He doesn't understand any of this. He just knows bang, 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 bang. Apple? Oh, yeah. Bang, 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 bang. That's what he understands. There's intelligence there, but it's not, it's not human intelligence. It's not being made in the image of God. Intelligence, okay? Um, God allows us, here's another one. God also gives us the ability to be emotional, like God is emotional. Do you know God is an emotional God? You read your Bible, you're going to find out there's a lot of things that he's, the Bible says he's joyful, we see that in Luke 15. The Bible tells us that he is sorrowful. He has times of sorrow, John 11, 35. We see anger is a big thing. That's a lot said there in, in Psalm 7, 11 is one of them. We see even times where God demonstrates indifference toward people for what they're doing and withdrawals away from them. Or we see times, we saw this in the Genesis uh, catastrophe where he demonstrates regret, feelings of regret that I wish this hadn't happened. Those are emotions that he has. How many, people, how many people in this room can give me those emotions? Let me, let me see somebody give me your, your joyful look on your face. See a few people. Some people are not awake. Okay. How many, got, how many got joyful? Let me see joyful. Let me see angry. Are you really angry? Or, I mean, I want, I want to see furious anger. <clears throat> okay. How many, let me see people that give me the attitude of indifference. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we're waking you up a little bit here. I'm hoping you're getting some of this, but here's the point. I want you to understand, we understand it. You go and look at a newborn baby in the hospital, and you know they know how to put on those expressions right at the very beginning? You everybody, anybody ever seen a little newborn baby smile? Yes, you have. You know, that's part of being made in the image of 
God. From the very beginning, we, we resemble those things. Okay, let me give you something else here. All right. <clears throat> So we got creative, moral, relational, communication, uh, emotions. Here's one that uh, people demonstrate. This is logic. Man is a logical person or logical creation, just like God is logical. Uh, we resemble that. Many times in scripture, you'll see God talking about reasoning with people. Come, come now and reason with me. He's wanting them to be logical. In fact, there's one point in, I believe it's in the book of Jeremiah, where he argues, uh, you take, you cut down a tree and you use part of that tree for fire and for food. You cook it and, you know, you cook on the fire to get heat to make food and all that kind of stuff. He says, and then the rest of the tree you use to make idols. And then you bow down to those idols and you worship them as though they're the ones that made you. And you know what God is doing with them? He's reasoning with them. You can't do that with your dog. You can't do that with your cat. You can't do that with a, with a pig. You can't do that with a gorilla. You know why? Because they're not made to reason. You are, though. And th that, is a, that is a characteristic of God being a reasonable God. Um, let me give you, give you some stuff. Let's see how well you pay attention in math class, okay? Uh, does anybody know what the answer is to this? Let me get back there. The answer is... Okay, to this. Okay, I'm going to teach you how to do it if you don't know it, okay? How, give me your answer, what do you think? One. Six. Give me answers here, quick, just shout them out. Seven. Okay, let me show you how to do this. You start with the parentheses. One plus two is three. Then you multiply times two, six. Six divided by six is? One. That's logic, okay? You all know, some of you knew it, how to do that, okay? Logic. You know why we're able to do that? You know why we're able to do that? Shh. You're an image bearer. Shh. You've never had a monkey doing that with his apples. Okay? You've never had anybody, any creature ever doing things of that nature. Human beings do that. Uh, how many people like to solve puzzles? How many people like to sit down and waste a whole day working on a puzzle? I don't, but I know people who do. I've bought puzzles and I quit on them and my wife takes over and finishes it because I get exhausted with trying to figure it out, okay? I like the bigger pieces. They're the easier to put together, you know, you know five, six pieces, and you're done, not the 5,000 pieces, okay? Um, but that's part of being, in, being an image bearer, is that you are logical. Uh, I'll give you another one. How many people like to solve mysteries or like watching mystery shows? Um, how many people uh, like, let me throw, go back to the idea of puzzles and mysteries here for a minute. How many people have ever been in one of those escape rooms, done one of those? Did you like doing that? Yeah. Yeah. You know what you're doing? You're solving a puzzle. You're trying to do something that's mysterious and make it alive to you. That's, that, is, that is being made in the image of God. You are bearing his characteristics, whether you knew it or not. You're bearing that, okay? Uh, let me go on a little further here. <clears throat> um, how many people have gotten sick and you've gone to the doctor? Why do you go to the doctor? Because they're s smarter than you are about your disease and they can figure it out and they can help you, right? You don't see any animals doing that. Why? Because they're not image bearers. You don't even have the, the, the smartest of the animals doing things like that. You know, I'm not even sure what the smartest of the animals. Maybe it's a dolphin or something. I don't know. Whatever the smartest of the animals are in the animal world does, has never reached the level of working on other people's brains or fixing other people's health problems. My sister just a week ago had to have brain surgery. And I scared for her, absolutely scared for her. For, scares me to think of the concept of somebody going up into your brain and digging stuff out of your brain, getting a, removing a tumor out of your brain to fix that. But you know why somebody could do that? Because they're made in the image of God. They're made in the image of God. Okay, let's go on here. Let's look at another characteristic. Well, this is one more that's a logical planning. Planning. How many people are planning on going on a vacation this summer? Maybe your parents are, hopefully, right? Uh, how many people make plans for the future? How many people are planning on going to college? Um, how many people have plans on what you're going to do after you get out of college? What, or, or if you don't go to college, what you're going to do after you get out of high school? Making plans. 
How many people are planning on getting married to such and such a person? No one raised their hand. They're too, they're too afraid to say that. We don't talk about that stuff here, do we? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's one of those things you don't say. Okay. You know, we, are, we have the ability to plan. You say, well, do animals have that? To some degree. The Bible talks about the ants prepare for the winter. But they're not preparing decades into the future. They're not setting aside money. I, here's, I'll give it from an adult perspective. Adults that are trying to think about their future set aside money and continue to set aside money so that when they get to a point they can't work, they're, they, they are able to take care of themselves that way. That's planning. That's foresight. That's, that's what human beings do. That's part of what it means to be made in the image of God. That's that logical nature, okay? Let's go on one more. Authority. Authority. Man has authority like God has authority. Let's go back and look at the creation. Genesis chapter number one, verse 26. It says, when God made man, look what he says. He said, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. This is what's called the dominion mandate. The dominion mandate. Uh, uh, in fact, if you were to go to Psalm chapter number eight, you see that dominion mandate once again s talked about. Uh, here's David talking about what God did with man. He says, he goes on, he asks the question, what is man that you're mindful of him, that you visit him and so forth. But then he says, thou hast made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. All that God created, man has the authority to have dominion over it. Uh, thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the fields, the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. God gave man the authority. Dominion, in fact, the word dominion means to have rule over or to dominate. Do you know it's an unbiblical concept to say the dinosaurs ruled the earth? There was never a time when the dinosaurs ruled the earth from a biblical vantage point. You know why? Because they never got that dominion mandate. There's only one part of the creation that was given that dominion mandate. It was us, mankind. It was our responsibility. From the very beginning, God gave that. And in a sense, you could say that Adam and Eve were the very first king and queen of the world. Who were they ruling over? Well, they weren't ruling over their children because they didn't have any at that time. So they were ruling over the creation. They ruled the animal world. And just like, uh, in fact, they were even given the garden. We were told that Adam was given the garden and, 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 the, and the scripture tells us he was responsible for dressing and keeping the garden. He had a responsibility to work that garden, to protect that garden. And he doesn't have a right to abuse or hurt the animals. That's, that's what dominion does, looks like. It's not abusive. It's not supposed to be at least. Now, that also would have meant that they had the responsibility of caring for the environment because the scripture says they were given dominion over all the earth, not just the animals, all things. They had that responsibility. Did you know today you have that responsibility? Your little part of the world that God has given you, whatever it is, your little corner of the world, you have a responsibility to do what you're supposed to do over that and take care of that and be responsible for it and leave it better than what it was when you found it. That's part of your dominion mandate being carried. And when you get older and you get out of, out of, out of high school and get out of college, some things are going to change in your life and you're going to have broader uh, things that you're just supposed to be involved in. Your responsibility is to care that way for the things that God has given you. You have a responsibility, a dominion mandate. The animals don't do that. You do, though. In fact, just to give you an example, the very first day that God made Adam, you know what Adam was supposed to do? To show, his, to show his dominion authority, name, would you say? Get, yeah, give them names. He had the responsibility of naming the animals. People name animals. Animals don't name animals. In fact, we all understand this concept. How many people have pets at home? <clears throat> How many people have a dog? More than one dog. You're good. How many people have cats? Oh, man. Nasty creatures. How many people have birds? How many people have lizards? Some kind of lizard reptile thing? Some of you. Okay. How many people uh, have named their animal, or had the privilege to name the animal you have in your home? You know why you named that animal? You're, you're recognizing, first off, ownership over it. 
authority over it. You may not have realized that, but you're demonstrating it. Uh, also, you're demonstrating that you love that creature, <laughs> that you're going to care for that creature. In a sense, that's what's happening when we talk about the dominion mandate that God gave man. Okay, you go on a little bit further. After, the, after Noah's flood, when Noah gets off the ark, he's worshiping the Lord. And the scripture says, once again, God does this again. Look at this. This is Genesis chapter 9. He tells the new set of humanity because the first set of humanity has been destroyed in the flood. Now all you have are eight people. And God, once again, reestablishes that dominion mandate with now the new set of humanity, Noah and his family. And listen to what he says. He says, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. In other words, you have the responsibility of being over them. And he mentions the fact that they have a fear of you and a dread of you, which speaks to the fact that things have changed because of what they were when God originally made them. They weren't so scary and they weren't so terrible to be around and they didn't fear man because man wasn't fallen. But now we have this broken part of the world and yet even though it's broken and humanity's broken and the animal world is cursed and all of this is happening, still the dominion mandate plays out at this point. Still it plays out, okay? So here's my conclusion. You're not an animal. You're not an animal. You are very much different. You are not some creature that evolved. You are not the product of millions of years of time and chance where things moved and moved and moved and moved and moved along until you got to you. Your great, 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 a hundred times back, great grandparents weren't monkeys. <laughs> You weren't swinging from a tree. Well, maybe not with your tail at least, right? All right. So let me give you a few applications. Give you a few applications. First off, <clears throat> when it talks about being made in the image of God, one of the things that brought up is authority. Being, a being in the dominion mandate. From a biblical perspective, there's a responsibility that every person has when it comes to obeying their authorities. Obeying their authorities. In fact, listen to what scripture says here. This is Romans chapter 13. It says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers or authorities. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. Here's what he's saying. All authority comes from God. We could trace it all the way back to the very beginning where God made Adam and Eve and he gave them authority. And then we can once again see it at, after, the, after the flood where God once again establishes that with Noah. And we can watch it throughout human history how authority has continually been given over and over and over. He says, God gave authority. It all comes from him. He is the original authority and those that have authority received it from God. And we are to honor and respect that authority because we are ultimately not honoring and respecting the person who bears that authority, but the one who gave them that authority. It's recognizing that that person has that authority because he's an image bearer and you are submitting to it. Again, going back to the idea of Adam and Eve being the very first rulers of the earth. So how does that look in more specific? Okay, that's a general understanding of obeying authority. How does that look more specifically? Obey your parents. The scripture says in Ephesians chapter 6, 1 to 3, children, obey your parents. Oh, uh, Brother Matt, you're getting down the path you're not supposed to go with high schoolers. I'm sorry if you don't like it, but that's true. They are authority bearers that God put in your life because they are image bearers and you are to respect their, the image of God that they have and the responsibility that they have to rule and lead over you. Submit to them. And then it doesn't say just obey. It says honor them. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first command with promise. Your parents are, are your God-given authority in your life as you grow up. And your job is to obey and honor them. Does that mean that they are always doing what they're supposed to do and are just the best examples of what it's supposed to be as a person and how you're supposed to behave as a Christian? Are they doing that? No, probably not. In fact, I don't, even me as a parent doesn't do that either. Brother Seth, uh, maybe Brother Seth's really good. We all struggle bearing our authority, but that doesn't give you a right to reject your authority. 
you recognize their authority, not because of who they are ultimately, but because who gave them the authority that they have. God is the, is the source of all authority, okay? And you honor them speaks more than just obeying, it speaks of attitude, okay? Here's another authority, police. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 4, uh, 13 and 14, it says this, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or as unto governors or as unto them that are sent by them for the punishment of evildoers for the praise of them that do well. Here in this passage, Peter's talking about the fact that God has set authorities over society, authorities over society to restrain evil. And their job is to, is to hold back evil and sometimes even punish evil. So how should you treat those that bear that authority, like the police or the governors or, or other people in, high, in position in that kind of sense of authority? How should you treat them? Well, when they're not looking, I'm just going to talk bad about them and do things that they wouldn't want me to do and speed and, and break laws and all that. That's not respecting that authority. You are completely completely dismissing the fact that they are image bearers and that's your responsibility and you're rejecting that. Honor that authority. Obey that authority. Well, I don't always like the laws that people have. I, just like going back to the parents. Not everything you have to do is something you want to do, but respect the authority that God has put over your life. Let me give you another one here. Brother Seth, <clears throat> this one's for you. Um, pastors. Pastors. Obey the pastors that God puts in your life. They are spiritual authorities. The scripture says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls. You know, your pastor and your Sunday school teachers and brother Gaddis here as your pastor and all the people that have positions of authority over your life in the, in the spiritual realm, you know what your responsibility is to do? To listen to them as they lead you. Submit to what they tell you out of the word of God. Don't cause them grief. In fact, it goes on to say that, that you do what they do so because they will have to give an account to God for their leadership. And he says, and they want to lead you with joy rather than with grief. I tell you the most miserable thing to go through, I think as a pastor, is people that you work with, you pour your life into and they just, they don't care. And they give no honor and respect to who you are and what you're doing and all the things you've invested in their life. And it grieves your soul as a pastor. Don't do that to your pastor, Brother Seth here. Don't do that to your Sunday school teachers that are sitting back here or to Brother Gaddis. Yes. Respect the authority. Well, why do they have the authority? I don't understand why they get to have that authority. God gave it to them because they're image bearers. And part of recognizing, part of being an image bearer is recognizing they have that right to have that authority. And I want to submit to it. Let me, I'm coming through. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> when we send back there. When we sinned in the world, it was really an attack against human authority. I mentioned that yesterday, that authority uh, was, a, was completely reversed. If you remember how it happened, the serpent went to the woman. The woman went to the man. The serpent was to be under the authority of the man and the woman. From a biblical perspective, even Adam was to be the ultimate authority. Adam, then Eve, then the animal world. It got completely turned on its head. When, this, when the temptation happened. Now you have the beast leading the woman and the woman leading the man. The authority, with the very first attack of sin was an attack against authority, okay? It was an attack against authority, okay? Um, let's go on. In fact, even God, whenever he confronts Adam, he says, because you have hearkened unto you the voice of your wife, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Now that doesn't mean don't listen to your wife. That doesn't mean don't have any respect for your wife. It means that my, I'm the ultimate authority. You should have gone that way rather than go the way you did, okay? Let's go on a little bit further here. Okay, so there's your serpent and, and so forth. So we got to the authority, all right? <clears throat> Let's go on to the next one. This one is gonna be a little more tender here if, if you can handle it, okay? Respect life. What it means to be an image bearer is to respect life. Murder is always wrong. Right. Murder is always wrong. The scripture says here, Genesis chapter 9, verse 5 and 6, after Noah gets off the ark, God reminds him of what you now need to do. He said, surely the blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast, will I require it at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require it the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. And here's the reason why. For in the image of God made he man. 
Why are you never to allow, why are you to be against murder? Because those people that get murdered are being attacked. They are image bearers of God and God requires judgment, punishment if somebody takes the life of another. And it's not just a slap on the wrist. They forfeit their own life. This is different than hunting and hunting animals. You know why it's different? I, I, whether you think it's okay to do that or not, the Bible gives absolute allowance. In fact, in the very passage that that was quoted, he's giving that allowance. That you can do that with animals. You can eat their flesh. Just don't drink their blood, right? Um, you can hunt them. Why? They're not image bearers. But you can't treat human beings that way. You can't put them in that, that category of just, they're just like animals. No, they're not. They're, they're image bearers, okay? Let's go on a little bit further here. Um, what about abortion? I'm gonna get a little, I told you, I'm gonna get a little more tender here. You hear about it, it's pushed in our, in our society everywhere. What about abortion? You know the Bible, Bible implies abortion's murder. It's murder. Politicians in our country for the last 50 plus years or so have tried to argue that abortion isn't murder and that it's the woman's reproductive right. But according to Genesis chapter nine, verse six, it's murder. You're shedding innocent blood. You're shedding innocent blood. Um, somebody says, you know, well, you're just a clump of cells. That, that little baby in there is just a clump of cells. That's all it is. Did you know that everybody in this room is a clump of cells? Brother Seth, you're a clump of cells. Every person sitting in this room is a clump of cells. Some of you are just much more clumps of cells than in the womb. Does that give you the right because one smaller clump of cells than what you are to take the life of that thing that's in the womb, the life of that child that's in that womb? Is it right for us to use that as an argument? Absolutely not. They're image bearers. They're image bearers right there in the womb. Well, someone says, well, maybe here's the argument that they use. It's my body, my choice. Oh, really? Is it your body? Is it your body? Did you know that that creature that's in your womb, if you are pregnant with that, a child, has an entirely different DNA than you do? Did you know if they happen to be a boy and you're a, you have a child in your womb, they have an entirely different sex than you? Did you know they have entirely different fingerprints than you? It's not your body. It's your body that God is choosing to use to house that child in a place to be protected until we born. You take the life of that child, you are violating Genesis 9, 6, and you are choosing not to recognize that child is an image bearer, an image bearer made in the image of God. Now, let me take you to the opposite spectrum, the opposite spectrum here. <clears throat> Since 1997, several uh, states in our country have voted to allow what they call medically assisted suicide. Let me give you some states that have allowed that for a minute. O Oregon, Washington, Montana, Vermont, California, Colorado, not a state, but Washington, D.C., Hawaii, New Jersey, Maine, New Mexico. Over the, the 2020 time during the COVID time, some news came out from Canada where they were talking about this thing called MAID. MAID is this, it stands for Medical Assistance in Dying. And they were pushing that basically anybody who wants to, that qualifies, can be medically assisted in dying. Let me give you a little baby two minute clip. If you can handle this, this will break your heart, but I, I edited it down quite a bit because I know for time's sake we can't do it, but other than that, it's also just break your heart. This is actually a real thing happening here. Listen to this. Ooh, it's so shimmery. Which kind of pen do you need? It's the night before Jeanette Loden's medically assisted death. She asked her family to decorate the lid of her coffin. Okay, once you do your hand, the 87-year-old Saskatoon artist has allowed CBC News nearly unrestricted access to the final moments of her life and her death. The day has finally come. Okay, so this is what's going to happen. The doctor's going to come in about half an hour. He's going to talk to Grandma alone for a little while, just to, she's, he's got to get final consent, and by law he has to make sure that nobody is making her do this. Um, so he's going to come in, he's going to talk to her, and then he's going to put an IV in, and then uh, 
then it'll be time for us to all say goodbye to her. You're the only one who can tell me if today is the day. Yeah, yeah, today is the day. Today is the day for sure. Yeah, for positive. The first step, Dr. Weiler inserts the empty IV line. Put this down. Mm -hmm. As he prepares the fatal medication in the kitchen, it's time for Jeanette to say her final goodbyes. Is it the right of us to take somebody's life, whether they're young or old? No. You, you say, well, but they might be sick and all that. Let me just give you an example in the Bible where that shows that responsibility. Who has that responsibility? This is, this is talking about Job. Job chapter 1. Job had his entire life wrecked that God himself allowed to happen. And here's Job's response. He said, the Lord gave and the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know what he was saying? He recognized there's only one who has the right to take life. It's not me. It's not me, no matter how bad my life is and how much I don't want it to go on anymore from all the things that have happened. It's not me who has that right. God alone has that right. He's the one that made us. He has the right to take us when he decides. Suicide is always wrong. It's murder. Taking a baby out of the womb and murdering it is, is wrong. And so is the other side. Let me finish it off with a couple more things. I'm, I'm trying to finish up here for you. The book of James also gives some more practical understanding. I've given kind of a deep one here, but this is a practical one. How do you, how do you talk about people? Do you know that God doesn't just care about whether you put a knife in somebody's back and, and, and murder, but he also cares what you use your tongue to do? In the book of James, listen to this. He says, therewith bless we God, even the Father, speaking of the tongue, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. So what you do in your speech, God cares about. The things you talk about, the people you talk about, you better make sure you're not using your tongue like a knife to stab other people and destroy other people's reputation because you're violating what it means to be made in the image of God. And in a sense, you're a murderer with your tongue. Jesus, in fact, in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, argued the fact that if a person was to say, call somebody a fool, he's guilty of hellfire. Why? Because he's a murderer in God's sight by the way he uses his tongue. Let me give it this. 1 John 3.15 says, He that hates his brother is a murderer. Murderer. All right. Lastly, you're not a mistake. Every person in here, as Brother Seth said earlier, is here because God wants you here. And you are not a mistake, no matter what people have said about you or done to you or, or treated how they've treated you. You're not a mistake. Every single person in here is an image bearer. Every person has a right and a responsibility to act out that image in this world the way God would have them do it. Let me just throw one little thought into this. How you were born is what you are. God gets the choice. Did you know your parents didn't get to choose whether you'd be a boy or a girl? Your parents didn't get that choice, neither do you. God alone gets that choice. You're not a mistake. And you know God has instructions for what boys and men are to look like, and he has instructions for what girls and young ladies are to look like. And equally, both sides are image bearers that have a responsibility to represent God in that role. That's your job. Now, ultimately, let's finish it with this. Jesus came to redeem image bearers. When you, when you sin, you've broken that image. In fact, it was already broken before you even took your first breath. We're all condemned in the person of Adam. God looks at us as, as condemned. When you're born, you're already condemned. It wasn't, didn't wait till you got to, to junior high and finally figure out that you're not supposed to do this or do that, that, that you suddenly entered into condemnation. You already are condemned. The Bible says that. But Jesus came and took upon himself the curse for us and died in our place. And one of the last things he said is, it is finished. Debt has been paid. Let me just show you how corrupt we are. How many people have lied in this room before? Raise your hand. 
How many people have stolen the Eighth Commandment, violated the Eighth Commandment? Raise your hand. Come on, all of you should be raising your hand, you liars. You just told me it. <laughs> Seventh Command says you're not to commit adultery. Jesus said if you look with lust, you commit adultery of the heart. How many people have done that? Come on, you want to be honest? Let's be honest here. How many people have used the Third Commandment, take God's name in vain? How many people have done that? Use God's name in vain. How many people have done that? You're violators of the law. You're guilty. The image is marred, but Jesus came to restore the image. He came to restore you back to God. And ultimately tonight, if you'll come back tonight, I'm asking, I know that this isn't maybe all the case for everybody, but if you can come back tonight, we're going to watch how that plays out. How what the Bible says that the Lord intends to redeem us and restore us and make a new heaven and a new earth where we will sit in glory with him and rule and reign with him. The image being restored. All right, well, started off bad. We'll start off good, went bad, but one day it'll become good again. Amen? Amen. All right, well, let's go ahead and pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word and how it teaches us these things. Help us, Lord, to apply them to our hearts and to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.